a good view of it? Yeah, we okay. do. Um, Carrie, if you hit Control Shift B. What about it? It will, um, I think it'll give us a little bit bigger view. A bigger view? Just Control Shift B. Then it will give us some space over your uh, bookmarks. Oh, I've got my bookmarks showing. Mm -hmm. uh, control shift B. Yeah, that was the one yep. that worked on the other day. Did it happen? It didn't. It's okay, though. All right. Uh, yeah, I just, okay. It's all good. All right. All really Are good. Are we good? We're, We're going to be in just a minute. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. Me and technology do not get off. along. If technology stressed us out, we'd all be stressed all the time. It is what it is, isn't it? <laughs> it does stress me out. But I can go ahead and um, we'll just breathe for a minute. It's kind of the universe telling us to take a deep breath. You should all just look at your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. It's all good now. I feel so much better. <laughs> it's very soothing, isn't it? It really it is. is. It's beautiful. Thank you. We're, it reminds we're so me good. of like if when when you look at because it's a window and it looks like when you're at a zoo that has you know all the the, the beautiful greenery and all the <laughs> apes are inside and that that's their jungle world. <laughs> that's what it looks like. All right, sister. Okay, how do we have it now? Do you have we the right have it, but There it is right there. That's good. Okay, you ready? All right. Wow, we had a little rocky start today, but we're good now. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone, Freeman, welcome. It's not too rocky. <laughs> it could have Anna, been do worse. You need, you are, do you need always, to... Uh, go ahead. I, it could have been a lot worse. Um, <laughs> So we're here tonight uh, with Dr. Jan Birkins and Carrie Yates, who presented last week. I'm welcome to be here, and um, I'm just so excited to hear part two and carried away. Thank you. Well, um, Donna, we are really grateful to have this chance to spend time with you again in this space and with um, whoever is with us tonight. We felt a really warm welcome last week and are glad to be back. Yes, thank you, Donna. You're welcome. We and all thanks to everyone. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And thanks to everyone for being here. Um, last week, we shared our story of the strategies we've learned and those we're actively working to get better at in order to keep this dialogue going between the members of these two communities who who label themselves of, as science of reading and balanced literacy. But you know, throughout the session last week, we emphasized the trickiness of these labels and the unhelpfulness of thinking of ourselves as sides of an issue, despite the need to have some vocabulary to reference what's going on in the field of literacy. But we do choose to use these labels in this series, nevertheless. And we also acknowledged last week that no matter where you are coming from, bridge building work is work that takes courage and it calls on us to use both our heads and our hearts. And we've promised to try to attend to both of those during this webinar series. And last week we surveyed the group a bit to see who was in the room and we learned that 23 of last week's participants described themselves as new to the science of reading, but ready to make some critical shifts in practice. And 37 of you described yourselves as well into your science of reading journey, but feeling like a fish out of water in your school or district. And three people last week told us that they were science of reading advocates and that our book makes them nervous. <laughs> and one person who was here last week identified as a balanced literacy advocate who also said they were in attendance because our book makes them nervous. And 30 people said they were tired of polarization. 
but unsure of how to bring people together. So no matter what your reason for coming last week or coming back this week, we know that everyone in this group has one goal in common. And that is we're all here to support children in becoming readers and writers. And yet we acknowledge the differences in approaches to instruction and the implementation of the science have led to some divisions in the field. And so we started last week by offering some insights and ideas from our own journey as we've wrestled with polarities ourselves. And we introduced five walls that we're working to avoid putting up. These are conversational and energetic moves that sort of block progress. The walls we identified are oops, certainty, binary thinking, judgment, dismissiveness, and overwhelm. And please, again, believe us when we say for us, <laughs> every single think in one of these is a work in progress. We've certainly not mastered um, preventing ourselves from putting these very um, walls up ourselves. And we want to know, and you could respond in the chat box, which wall resonated with you or did you find yourself maybe thinking about or bumping into um, over the course of the last week? We'd love to hear from you. And Oh, someone said yeah, five. Yeah, maybe seeing the well. chat because I'm a little discombobulated and I'm not I seeing see the it. chat. <laughs> so, Alicia said all of them. Oh. <laughs> Wendy said five. Tracy said three. Jen said all with all caps. Oh. Yeah, it's it's pretty vulnerable work. Number two, binary thinking was striking to Kristen. Sandra said three. Judgment. Hmm. Um, Kay Havard said two and three. We got lots of that. We'll we'll crunch these numbers and we'll we'll share them with you next week to see what the trends are. But thank you so much for for sharing your thoughts with us. Lots of fives. Yeah. Overwhelm yeah. seems seems popular. <laughs> Was popular with us this week for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it sure was. All right, and so. For each wall, we offered a corresponding bridge that we are trying to build. And each brig is a tool we depend on to support connection, dialogue, reflection, and learning. And the five bridges are curiosity, complexity, vulnerability, listening, and entry points. And again, we want to know, please respond in the chat box, which of these bridges really speaks to you? Or did you find yourself with opportunities to cross this bridge this week or to build one of these bridges? Just jot your responses in the chat, chat box. And I'm so excited to see what's, what's coming in. <laughs> All right, we've got some fives, entry points, four, listening, listening, this week, I spoke to many of my colleagues and listened. Oh, that's great. That's so beautiful. Fours and fives. Fours and fives really seem to want to be the ones. And, you know, those are the ones that are action oriented. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. And we, um, you should have received an email. If you were, if you participated last week, you received an email with this attachment that includes the five walls and five bridges. And if you didn't get it, you could find it on the downloadables page of our website, the six shifts.com. You'll find it there just within probably 25 minutes of us being done tonight, since I realized that didn't happen this week. <laughs> Back to the <laughs> overwhelm one. Back to the overwhelm. Okay. <laughs> Yet, before we dig into our content tonight, we want to really, again, state that we are not researchers or scientists or experts in SOR. We are here as learners who've rolled up their sleeves, dug into the research, and just tried to offer some thinking to bridge the gap. 
we also know we have a lot left to learn. Last week, we talked about the power of the rethinking cycle as described by Adam Grant. And that's definitely where we are camped out these days, rethinking and thinking a little harder. So tonight in part two of this series, we're going to use our book, Shifting the Balance, to share our ideas about some high leverage starting points for bringing more science of reading into the balanced literacy classroom. And we're big believers, as you probably know by now, in just jumping in and getting started. And that's what shifting the balance can help teachers do. Because momentum has to start somewhere. So we wrote this book for a very specific audience. We wrote it for balanced literacy teachers who were overwhelmed, hesitant, or even resistant to shifting their practices to better align with reading science. And we're really intentional about making sure the reader's energy went into understanding the content and not into trying to navigate the book. So there's this really, we think, fun and intentional design structure um, that's the same for every chapter. Um, and every chapter is color coded and my favorite part of the book, truly favorite part is the, uh, what do we call them Jan, page bleeds that uh, help us easily find our way to each of the chapters. Um, but there's a really intentional design structure that's the same for each chapter. And we're gonna walk you through that just so you get a feel for the organization of the book. If you've not read it yet, or maybe you've got it um, on order and it's, it's coming and you're getting ready to dig into it. So um, first, every chapter starts with a common classroom scenario that, that features a, a recognizable practice that usually turns out to be based on ideas that seem to make really good sense to us from the outside, but are actually based more on our intuition about how reading works from an outside perspective. And so we take a look at that classroom scenario. We, we maybe notice some things that in practice are working um, or that in practice are familiar, but something's off with what kids are learning. And then we move from the scenario to sort of untangling the kinds of related misunderstandings that might be driving those practices. Practices, again, that on the surface seem sounder than the science proves them to be. We address four or five key misunderstandings in each chapter. Then we provide a bulleted list summary of the key science. Uh, short bullets that highlight what we think are some key understandings to carry forward. And that moves us into the second half of each chapter. After having built respect for the why behind the shift, we dedicate the second half of each chapter to the tools for making the shift. These tools include high leverage instructional routines that are intended to help teachers identify immediate starting points. Not because they've already learned everything they need to know about the science, but because they've learned enough to get started and we we find that getting started will drive curiosity to learn more. And then after sharing tools for making the shift, we revisit that same classroom from the opening scenario to find that the teacher is working to make some shifts in their practice, implementing simple but practical adjustments um, in response to having learned um, something more about the science. Uh, in other words, we see the teacher shift from practices that are largely based on an outside in assumptions to practices that are based on a clearer understanding of what's really going on inside that reading brain. And finally, we end every chapter with a set of questions intended to help an individual teacher, a PLC, a school, or really even a district leadership team reflect on current practices and intentionally plan for next steps. So how are we going to do this mini book study tonight in less than an hour's time? And after much debate and discussion between the two of us and a few false starts, we decided to share with you a 222 book walk tonight. Well, a 222 book walk is what we're going to do with each chapter, which has, um, we're going to share two common misunderstandings 
out of the four or five that are there, two key science ideas out of the many that are in the chapter, and two tools for making the shift out of the many that are included in the second half of the chapter. So keep in mind that there are a lot more misunderstandings, there's a lot more science, and there are a lot more instructional practices in the book. And we had more than a little bit of conversation about which ones to include. It was hard to leave things out, but we um, certainly won't get to everything tonight. And we felt like this 222 format would give you a good flavor for the book and how it is structured. And when we selected, especially the practices, we were really focused on bridge building. We were really focused on things we felt could make an easy bridge, that starting point. Mm -hmm. um, so our overall goal is to give teachers high leverage starting points that make this lift of transformative change feel accessible. Um, we wanna mention that although each of the chapter topics language comprehension, phonemic awareness, phonics instruction, and so on. Each of them stand on its own in terms of representing an important shift to practice, um, but they also intentionally build on each other, especially with regard to how the science is unpacked in a cumulative way from the earlier to the later chapters. So if you read one chapter from the end of the book in isolation, there is a risk that something will sort of be lost in translation. But let's dig into the book. So we intentionally began the book with a chapter that addressed a big concern of many, many balanced literacy teachers. And, and really the research of writing this book for us started with listening to balanced literacy teachers. And so they're hesitant to embrace systematic phonics oftentimes because they're worried that children will learn to decode, but they won't learn to comprehend. And so in the opening scenario for chapter one, we meet Mr. Tucker, a second grade teacher, and he's working with Kanisha. And Kanisha labors to chunk out several long words, but she simply doesn't have the background knowledge to understand the text, even though she can decode these words correctly. And another student, Olivia, breezes through words and sounds really fluent. Maybe you've taught a student like Olivia. I know that I have but she doesn't seem to get beyond sentence level comprehension. And Mr. Tucker is frustrated and a bit concerned, understandably, about his kids' comprehension. And Mr. Tucker's work with Kanisha points to something that needs to shift in many classrooms, and that is the tendency to overlook the role of language comprehension or listening comprehension in reading comprehension. So the first misunderstanding in chapter one that we want to share is that reading comprehension begins with print. It's basically this assumption that until children can decode, we can't really do anything to support their reading comprehension. And that once they can decode, any comprehension issues will be solved with strategy instruction. Hmm. And the second misunderstanding is that spoken language and written language are two completely different things and that comprehending the first one will develop on its own while comprehending the latter requires a lot of strategy instruction. And to untangle these misunderstandings, we explore our language comprehension systems and unpack the work of our phonological processing system, our meaning processing system, and our context processing system we look at the work that these systems are wired to do. And then we add the orthographic processing system to illustrate that reading comprehension actually piggybacks on listening comprehension and finish out the four part processing model. Incidentally, we have for reading, for reading comprehension on the top of this diagram because reading comprehension is what we're trying to um, make all the readers feel better about the risk. And so it's the ultimate goal of any experience with text and comprehension is the big concern of many balanced literacy teachers. So we wanted to just address it right up front. Make readers of the book feel better about. Yes, absolutely. Not the children, although they could feel better too. <laughs> Another piece of science we present in chapter one is the simple view of reading. 
And we share this model to connect listening comprehension or language comprehension. We use those sort of synonymously, although they're not exactly synonymous, um, to decode as one of two critical variables in reading comprehension. And so after introducing this and all the other science in the chapter, we offer the shift. This is the shift we're asking teachers to make, and that is to treat oral language development as an essential ingredient for comprehension. So we've shared two misunderstandings and two pieces of the science. So we're two thirds of the way through our two, two, two model. And now we're gonna look at two tools. So the first tool we offer is inviting teachers to make space for more conversation in the classroom. Quiet classrooms are not supportive of reading comprehension. So whether the conversation is in connection with a read aloud or incidental talk on the way to lunch, we have to give children more opportunities to practice spoken language if we want them to comprehend written text. And we refer a lot to Grover Whitehurst's work to get really specific about some things teachers can do to make those conversations more impactful. And you can download this tool as a PDF at our website as well. But by doing something as simple as repeating and expanding what children say, we can dramatically accelerate children's vocabulary learning. So in this slide, the child makes a comment about the picture the child says, he is jumping in the water and the teacher responds by repeating, yes, he is jumping in the water and then expanding, adding some interesting vocabulary and context by saying he's splashing in the pond with his galoshes. So making space for these conversations is the first instructional tool for chapter one. And the second tool we want to highlight is using and collecting interesting words, which is what the teacher in the closing scenario of the chapter decides to try. It's so easy to get children really excited about vocabulary words and any exposure to a word increases lexical quality. So by asking children to gather on the floor rather than just come sit on the floor or by making a point to pull high utility interesting vocabulary words out of a read aloud and offer a kid friendly definition. This is the kind of work that sets children up for later reading comprehension of those words and even for more success with decoding the words. So it's a win win. So we wrap up our time in chapter one with this quote from the book. As students become more adept at decoding, they move into increasingly complex texts. These texts contain words and ideas that require more sophisticated language. So developing more competence with decoding can actually reveal a different barrier, language. Uh, okay, so next we move to chapter two, recommitting to phonemic awareness. We open chapter two with Ms. Martin, who is part of a kindergarten PLC team that is reviewing some mid-year data about phonemic awareness and letter names and sounds. And what becomes sort of clear in this conversation is that the team has some confusions about those three PH words, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, and phonics. And Ms. Martin is also really puzzled as she's coming to grips with students who know all sorts of letter names and sounds, but are scoring in the high risk category on tasks that include, um, that require phonemic awareness, such as phoneme segmentation. She realizes that she's curious to learn more about these tasks and what the scores really mean for her students and for her instruction. And so the common practice to reconsider in this chapter is taking a bit of this and bit of that approach to phonemic awareness instruction, which we also sometimes refer to as a potluck approach where everyone kind of <laughs> contributes whatever um, phonological or phonemic awareness activities um, they have and, and add them to the collective pot rather than taking a more systematic approach. So tonight, we want to highlight the first misunderstanding from the chapter. Misunderstanding one is that phonemic awareness develops naturally. And 
I mean, of course, you probably already know or maybe can guess that um, phonemic awareness does not develop naturally. And so um, that's the first misunderstanding we want to clear up. And the second one, which I think is just really common, is this misunderstanding that once children know all their letters and sounds, they're kind of good to go and they're ready to learn to read. Um, but the first bit of science we describe in chapter two is, is this science related to um, the phonological processing system and the ways that it's naturally wired to kind of listen and scan the environment for meaningful chunks of language, words, sentences, phrases, but that it's not, we are not wired to um, naturally hear those little sounds, those phonemes in words. The phoneme level, distinguishing and manipulating individual parts in words is something that humans had to teach themselves to do only when and because they invented written language. And so phonemic awareness is really a very new job for our brains and every child has to kind of, by the time they're going to become a reader, make their own discovery of the individual sounds within words. In this chapter, we also clarify that terminology that's easy to mix up. So we spell out the difference in phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, phonics instruction, highlighting the importance of getting to the phoneme level in phonological awareness work as quickly as possible because that's the piece that helps kids become readers and writers. After exploring this and a lot more of the science around phonemic awareness instruction, we share this shift a commitment to intentional, systematic phonemic awareness instruction. And then we offer a number of tools to support phonemic awareness instruction, including the two we're gonna share with you right now. <clears throat> so the first teacher move to help make the shift that we wanna to highlight tonight, we call let's notice how sounds are made. This move is about the power of taking time to explore articulatory gestures during phonemic awareness instruction. We think this might be really new to many balanced literacy teachers, um, but it is this opportunity to explore how different sounds are made in different ways with our mouths and our tongues and our teeth and our airflow. And we can do this work by simply having children like place their hands on their throats to feel voiced sounds or in front of their mouths to feel airflow or by looking in a mirror or at a partner's tongue when they make the sound and we see that tongue poking out. By doing this multi-sensory exploration of sound production, we make our phonemic awareness instruction not only more fun because kids love this exploration, but what we're really doing is help build the distinction between sounds, um, making it more clear down the road when they are reading and writing. Now, I'm not an expert on articulatory gestures. And when I did my own letters training, this was a segment that sort of baffled and um, blew me away studying all of those fancy names for the types of sounds we make. If you want to know more about articulatory gestures, you're going to have to go way beyond our book. And we know that letters training is one avenue that can really provide an opportunity to dig deeper into these ideas. Then the second move we want to highlight here um, is, um, is to give kids lots of practice with oral blending and segmenting across the day. You can practice blending and segmenting words in any transitional moments of the day, as well as during phonemic awareness and phonics lessons. So children love games and we love the simple game called, what's my secret word? Where we just blend or segment a word. What's my secret word? Sh, er, I, m gives kids a chance to practice blending. And once we played that game with kids some and we turn the power over to them, they can actually take 
some words apart, segmenting them and offer them to a partner in the same way. So this simple activity can be used in intentional and increasingly complex ways, while kids at the same time can learn to take charge of it for themselves, teach it to their families, and even play it with friends. We highlighted this one because it doesn't take any stuff you can do it in any given moment of the day, but also because we know there are lots of opportunities to weave phonemic awareness and phonics together once we introduce that piece as well. So we end with this quote, on this side of history, it may seem obvious, but the discovery of this idea that words are made up of little sounds that can be individually represented with symbols was a monumental intellectual feat. It at last provided the path for humans to say absolutely anything in one time and space and then unlock it word for word in a completely different time and space. Ah, the power of a phoneme. <laughs> so now we start chapter three, which includes an invitation to reimagine the ways we teach phonics. And we open chapter three with Miss Lynn, who is a first grade teacher working hard at teaching phonics in ways that will be fun and engaging for her students, but more and more, she has a nagging concern about what students are really taking away from her phonics instruction. In particular, she's noticing that there aren't many opportunities for them to practice the concepts from their phonics instruction in the text that they're reading. And furthermore, she realizes she's not even that clear on who knows what in terms of phonics patterns. And so Ms. Lynn's story is a common example of what often happens when we settle for a leave too much to chance approach to phonics instruction, which is a practice that we ask readers to reconsider in this chapter. And to help readers rethink their phonics instruction, we take on five misunderstandings um, but of course, we only picked two to share with you tonight. Wasn't easy, but we did it. And the first misunderstanding is misunderstanding three. And it's that phonics isn't really worth teaching because English is so unpredictable and its spellings are just unreliable. It's basically this common idea that there are so many rules to begin with. And then there are so many exceptions to those rules that it's just not worth teaching phonics. And the second misunderstanding for tonight is misunderstanding five, and it's that learning phonics is boring, which is a real concern of balanced literacy educators. And to unravel these misunderstandings, one piece of theory from the book um, is this concept of deep orthography. And we make the case that English's deep orthography is actually a reason to teach it rather than a reason not to teach it. And a second scientific concept we unpack is this idea that the brain learns phonics from simple to more complex to even more complex. And that this filing system, which enables storage and retrieval makes solving the code more engaging and more accessible. And so we chose to acknowledge the concern about student engagement and boring phonics lessons up front rather than to dismiss it because as you know, dismissiveness creates walls. And so yes, there is some unnecessarily boring phonics instruction in the world. We've probably all seen it and that is problematic. But learning the written code, like code breaking and solving puzzles, can be fun and engaging and empowering, even if it is hard work. And we can work together to make the challenge of learning phonics and get engaging for kids. And so, at, yes. Remind me, but this picture is like the magic decoder ring from the Christmas story. Yeah, right? that's the magic. That's the magic decoder ring from the Christmas story movie. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and when he gets his Ovaltine decoder ring and how excited he is. And, and we think kids can be that excited about um, learning how our written code works. Mm -hmm. 
So at the end of the science section or the theoretical section, we offer this overarching shift, a commitment to explicitly and systematically teach children the secrets of how our written code works. And then we share a number of ways to enact the shift in the classroom, offering some really specific guidance on some of them. And the first practice involves giving children lots of practice reading and writing words, this idea of high volume practice, whether teaching them to blend with continuous phonation or helping them stretch out words to write them. We want high volume practice with the phonics skills they're learning in their phonics lessons. And we've made some free tools to help you do this. They're on our downloadables page at the sixshift.com. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm going to kind of crack up. I think that rolled out of my mouth wrong. You know, shift is a tricky word. <laughs> it's a tricky word to say fast. And it only takes one phoning for it to become a little, a little embarrassing. And so for a lot of the different sound spellings children need to learn, these tools will give you lists of words that they might use to practice. We, we also assembled some practice sentences for you. You'll want to look at these lists and sentences through the lens of what your students do and do not know about how words work and, and what you're looking for to teach them, but we do offer them as a starting place or an entry point for you. Mm -hmm. And the second high level instructional practice we recommend is using word chains to build words. This is such a simple simple practice, but so powerful and engaging. Um, it's so simple that Marnie Ginsburg at Reading Simplified um, leverages word chains, which she refers to as switch it as a powerful routine in her work with kids. So you'll find her videos helpful um, as you get started with word chains as well. And you don't have to start from scratch on developing word chain lists either. We've made some collections of word lists that children can build changing one letter at a time. And we draw on the recent work of Susan Brady to make the word chains we build very in difficulty. So this brings us to the end of shift three and we wrap up with this quote from the book. The upfront support we provide with beginning to solve the great puzzle of our written code not only sets children up for success in the moment, but is also proven to increase reading motivation, reading volume, and confidence down the road. Hey, Jan, I'm, um, I'm getting my groove. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm driving the slides now and, uh, you know, attending to the chat just a little bit. And there was actually quite a bit of chat about the phonemic awareness piece. And I, I just want to thank everybody who's sharing lots of good um, resources here for yeah. um, articulatory gestures. I saw a couple of things yeah. that I really want to check out. Um, lively letters. I don't know about lively letters and I'm excited to learn more about that. And, I like the name. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also somebody's um, pointing out um, David Kilpatrick's work, which we love and draw on heavily in our thinking about phonemic awareness. Um, mm -hmm. We also have on our website, if you're looking for a simple starting point, we didn't mention it, but it actually lays out um, many different increasing complexity, um, just oral exercises that you can do with your, your children beyond the simple game we shared of what's my word. Um, but yeah, and I so appreciated, um, I'm now I, I'm not completely finding my groove, but the person that said, I'm guilty, I know I've done that phonics instruction that has been less than engaging. I just appreciate so much the, um, the humility in that as we all look at our practices. And, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Letterland, Haggerty, lots of resources being shared. All right. So then we're going to move on to chapter four. And this is where we ask teachers to take a deep look at high frequency word instruction. In chapter four, we open with a scenario of a teacher who's working hard 
to give her kids lots of practice with writing and chanting sight words. She's using flashcards and rainbow writing and Play-Doh and all sorts of all sorts of different paths, but experiencing time and time again, and we've all been there, we've worked so hard to explicitly teach a word, but then a student encounters that word in writing. I'm sorry, they, they, yeah, they encounter the word in print while reading or during writing time, they want to use that word in their own writing and they come up blank. They don't recognize the word or they just don't seem to have it in their memory. And so, um, we kind of, we ask ourselves what's going on. And, um, so the common practice that we're, we're asking balanced literacy teachers to reconsider here is taking a just have to memorize them approach to teaching high frequency words. Um, especially those that have some funky or unexpected spellings often called irregular or irregularly spelled words. So the first misunderstanding that we wanna share from chapter four is misunderstanding two. And that is this idea we've gotten that high frequency words can't be decoded. And the next one, which is very much related to it, which is children just have to memorize irregularly spelled high frequency words as whole units. They've gotta just know them by sight. <clears throat> and you know the way we the way we wrote this when we share these slides and even in the book we we had the word misunderstanding really big because if these statements are taken out of taken out of context it it sets up opposite <laughs> of what we're trying to do so these are misunderstandings so these statements are statements we believe are problematic the first time we saw the proofs for the book the word misunderstanding was super small <laughs> and these statements were super big. So when you page through the book, it just basically looked like all the misunderstandings were the chapter headings and that seems problem then. But so in chapter four, the idea is that high frequency words can't be decoded. Children just have to memorize words as whole units. Um, it, it, it's, um, it all kind of focuses around this idea of relying on sight um, as, as the way to get words into the brain. Um, but we, we know that what the science tells us is, is that in order for words to be, get stored in long-term memory in ways that will allow for instant recognition, the brain must learn to recognize them not as whole objects memorized by sight, like we learn to recognize a tiger or a boat, but as meaningful letter strings. And of course, this, this pushes against common practices that might seem to make intuitive sense, but actually make learning to read harder rather than easier. And the other bit of science that we lean into in this chapter is that of helping children to come to know words in ways that connect all four language processing systems. And that is to deepen the lexical quality of a word by ensuring that students have opportunities to know it by meaning, by context, by phonology, and by orthography. And all of this science brings us around to the idea that we must really create opportunities for students to dig into those high frequency words that we want to become sight words and to pull apart the phonemes um, in these high priority words, aligning those phonemes to the graphemes that represent them. Um, so as we think about the shifts in this chapter, one thing the chapter helps teachers to do is to prioritize or reprioritize high frequency words that, um, that will need the most explicit attention in our teaching. And so the two moves that we're going to feature here are actually not about selecting the words, but about how to teach in powerful and explicit ways to help those brain those those words get into the brain's um, long term storage for quick retrieval. And so the first teacher move is a shift away from treating word recognition as something we do with our eyes alone and to start to recognize it as an activity that needs to connect 
the language processing systems. So we offer this quick and easy word learning routine that will engage students in thinking about meaning, using context, exploring the word phonologically, and then looking at the actual orthographic spelling of the word in just a few quick minutes. But that's not all. Our second move here relates to that same routine. And this is the really big part. This is where we recognize that no, just because they're tricky spellings, we don't shy away from thinking about the spellings. We dig in and we align the speech to print. So we um, pick words apart to figure out how many phonemes are in them and figure out how do those sounds align to the spellings. We like to do it with using a Elkona box in sort of a reverse way. And the final step is if there are funky spellings, we just recognize them to kids. But what we're trying to do, rec recognize them with kids, but what we're trying to do here is that work that Kilpatrick calls meaningful letter strings. We've got to help kids make sense of every one of these spellings in order for it to be able to um, move into orthographic mapping, right? And although we know orthographic mapping is a process that happens inside a student's brain, we can't do it for them. We can set up instructional practices that actually scaffold or um, position kids for easier path to orthographic mapping. So we end with this quote, lexical quality grows each time a child notices or learns something more about a word's sound structure, spelling, or meaning. And what's happening in the chat, Jan? Anything we should stop and oh, recognize? I wasn't watching it. I, I oh. you know, I can only focus on one thing. I was, I was transfixed by what you were saying. So let's see. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, there's something yeah. coming from calling That's sounding great. out sight words. Yeah. Okay. Any questions for us here? Anything we should address? No, nope. they just want to no, know when to register. Yeah. And the heart words from really great reading. They've got beautiful videos there as well. I noticed that they're rolling yeah. out. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's so see. we're moving into chapter five. And we want to mention that a lot of the questions we've received so far are about chapter five. Um, for tonight, we're gonna stick with our two, two, two format as we wrap up chapters five and six. But next week, we're going to dig into some of the specific questions that folks have about chapter five. And chapter five begins with Ms. Sanchez, who is a second grade teacher working hard at the guided reading table. She's listening to and coaching her students as they read the day's text. And it's clear in the scenario that Ms. Sanchez is working hard to give her students a wide range of strategies for their problem solving toolboxes. And they in turn are working hard to apply these strategies at the point of difficulty in text. But despite an anchor chart full of strategies, her students still seem to encounter many unproductive detours and dead ends as they navigate reading their text. And understandably, Ms. Sanchez is concerned. And so this scenario really illustrates the central topic of concern in this chapter, which is the problem of treating decoding as a backup strategy, rather than teaching children to rely on decoding as the problem solving mainstay of their word solving efforts. And the first misunderstanding that we want to talk about tonight is misunderstanding one in this chapter, which is the really huge mistaken idea that prompting children to use graphophonemic relationships, saying things like sound it out to figure out a word is actually bad for readers. And this- But it's not, this, right? It's not. No, it's not. I we was going to say it was bad for readers. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's not. So it, encouraging students to sound out a text is a huge paradigm shift for many balanced literacy teachers. So we were really intentional about putting this content in chapter five towards the end of the book after readers both had some familiarity with the science that was accumulating across the book. And also, hopefully, they had some trust, trust in us. And the second misunderstanding we want to share is misunderstanding four from chapter five, which is the assumption 
the mistaken assumption that the primary purpose of decoding is to figure out the word in front of you. And so in terms of the science in this chapter, not surprisingly, we, we return to the four-part processing model to reiterate the roles of the processing systems. And we also introduce the concept of set for variability, um, which is my favorite. And what we love about set for variability is that it offers the balanced literacy teacher a view of the science-based role that context actually plays in reading. Um, and so many balanced literacy teachers think of as meaning and structure. That's what they think of context as. And so we want them to have this exposure to how context actually plays out in word reading. And, and this calls into question uh, the MSV model. And in the theoretical part of chapter five, we also talk about the value of word reading that is beyond the moment and the ways that not decoding the word sound by sound means that children miss opportunities to build orthographic knowledge and to increase lexical quality. So it's, it's work that they're doing for the future as much as it is about figuring out the words on the page now. And so with the shift in this chapter, we ask teachers to prioritize prompting to print. And by print, we mean decoding or matching all the graphemes in a word sequentially to their known sounds and blending them together. And after that, we want readers to use context or meaning and structure to cross check and self monitor their decoding efforts. Hopefully all of this work is in text that align with what children have learned about phonics a topic we address in chapter six. And of course, we offer some instructional moves for chapter five, two of which we'll share with you now. We start with the ways we prompt kids, or maybe you refer to it as feedback, when they are working in a text and we tell teachers to teach children to decode first by saying something like, start with the words on the page. Or you might say, start with print. Or if you're a balanced literacy teacher, you might use the term visual, which is part of the vernacular of the balanced literacy community and the term we use in the book. And if that is a word that triggers you a little bit, maybe um, we understand. And we'll unpack that a bit in the next session. But for now, when we say start with visual, we are prompting teachers to have children do the things we've been advocating all the way through this book by always sounding out the words on the page first, grapheme phoneme relationship by grapheme phoneme relationship. And we offer some language uh, to try out when working with students at the point of difficulty to teach them to first and foremost begin decoding. And the sec second instructional move we recommend, we call looking before leaping. The look part we just talked about, but the leaping is about set for variability, which, which suggests that once students have used all the phonics knowledge they have, they should ask themselves if the word they came up with makes sense. And if not, what word would make sense? So this tool highlights the word that the brain does to leap from a close phonetic approximation to the known word. From Kawa to cow. Yes, <laughs> or, or there's a great video of um, David Kilpatrick talking about putt and put mm -hmm. where he says, you know, and then context comes in and helps the student get from putt to put or is it put to putt? I don't, it would be putt to put. Um, and so we wrap up chapter five with this quote which encourages teachers to teach children to analyze every bit of a word, not just the first letter. Although theories about readers sampling letters across words are popular and strategies for sampling letters are often taught to young readers, eye movement technology makes the experimental science on this topic clear. Proficient readers do not sample some letters and skip others. Hmm. Somebody's commenting on how hard it's been um, to to prompt students to decode on digital text from a distance. Mm -hmm. Your eyeballs mm -hmm. on the word on the screen. Yeah. Wow. You all have worked so hard this last year, figuring out so many things. 
We're going to um, jump into our final chapter then. Here we are at chapter six, the final stop on our 222 book walkthrough. And chapter mm -hmm. six takes a look at some of the limitations of texts for beginning readers, predictable early leveled texts, as well as decodable texts. But ultimately, the chapter invites and encourages balanced literacy teachers to reconsider um, and ultimately make space for the benefits of quality decodable texts. We begin the chapter in Miss Quinn's kindergarten classroom. And Miss Quinn is a hardworking kindergarten teacher who's deeply committed to having readers spend time with eyes on print, as well as giving them opportunities to develop oral language using beloved trade literature. She has kids interacting with books during both independent reading and small group instruction. But more and more, she's concerned about the text experiences her students are having. So many of her students seem to read their familiar A and B level texts relying on a combination of memory you know, the kid who reads, reads a book without looking at the words um, and the picture clues. And on the other hand, she has students who are trying to rely on the print, but they're struggling to get a foothold because they keep encountering spellings that are beyond their current decoding skills. And so in this chapter, we take a look at the complexity um, and importance of choosing texts for the beginningest of readers. And the common practice that we ask teachers to reconsider is um, thoughtfully selecting, I'm sorry, this is wrong, Jan. I just have to skip this slide. This isn't the practice to reconsider. I've got to open my book. How about that? <laughs> has page bleed so you can Sorry, find this thing easily. has page bleeds it should say over relying on predictable texts to get kids quickly up and running and that's what we want to get teachers to reconsider um, and we start with misunderstanding one and that is this um, um, idea, maybe bad rap that decodable texts have gotten. And the misunderstanding is decodable texts are loaded with problems. And it is true um, that, that some decodable texts are less quality than others. Um, and many balanced literacy teachers have concerns about decodable texts that stem from encountering texts that might have unnatural language, tongue twistery, even nonsensical storylines. And this has possibly fed their affinity, um, the affinity that many of us in the balanced literacy community have developed for predictable texts at the earliest levels of reading. Um, but what we have to admit is those texts are certainly not without their problems either, as is revealed in Misunderstanding 2. Predictable texts make learning to read easier. Of course, it's important to find simple starting points. We're talking about that here, right? And learning to read is complex. And I think we've offered predictable texts as a simple starting point. Um, we want to see kids get up and reading with, get up and reading quickly. And highly predictable texts with explicit picture support can make children sound like they're successfully reading without them really having to slow down and look carefully at the print in front of them. So in this chapter, we revisit airy stages of word learning and we align them with the need for texts that are really well matched to the stage of development. And figure 6.6 .6 in the book demonstrates this critical importance of children having texts that give them reasons to slow down and look carefully at all of the print, even if this makes them sound less skilled for a while. The good news we think is that this period of slow analysis and even sometimes some stilted sounded reading, sounding reading while they decode um, it will be short lived if children have adequate practice aligned to the decoding skills that are within their grasp. 
we also offer the idea in this chapter that this um, this slow but necessary stage of lots of decoding leads to lots of opportunities for orthographic mapping and long-term orthographic knowledge building. The key is getting kids practice with text that will give them a helpful mix of words. And in doing so, we teach children that print is a reliable source of information, one that can be depended on. When their texts are too full of words they can't solve by sounding out, they are forced to rely on strategies that aren't as helpful in the long run. And so these are some of the ideas we unpack in this chapter. We move from, um, we move from the common practice to reconsider over relying on predictable text to get kids up and running quickly to this shift, thoughtfully selecting or creating texts with the decoding opportunities students need to practice. This means letting go of practices that scaffold success by having kids go around the texts. I'm sorry, by having kids go around the words in text rather than going through the words. So what about the teaching moves for shift four? Shift six. Shift six. Thanks. <laughs> At least it's not the kind of error we had on the slide last week. <laughs> so the first, the first of the um, teacher moves we want to highlight in this final chapter six is the opportunity to um, evaluate texts. This recommendation we see as a powerful bridge building and professional learning opportunity rolled all up in one. This is the simple suggestion to invite a group of grade level colleagues to sit down and look at some books for beginning readers together. Whether those texts are currently classified as decodable or predictable or leveled, the goal is to sit down and see what you notice together. Whether these texts are texts from your current collection or maybe you're even considering purchasing new texts, there's a lot to think about with beginning reading texts. And so to support you with this work, we've designed a simple tool to get the conversation going. And you can find this, you guessed it, on our downloadables page at the sixshifts.com. This tool uh, really recognizes these three pairs of dynamic tensions that exist with beginning reading texts, decodability versus predictability, novelty versus repetition and orthographic value. Um, and sense making value. So we've provided those, uh, this tool that also includes six questions that will just help you refine your thinking and develop the skill for choosing those high quality texts that really align with the current learning kids are engaged with. And the second um, teacher move we offer here is we invite you into writing some aligned texts for yourself. This is a decodable text op option that fits any budget. And really <laughs> it's easier than you think and can be a powerful chance to practice your own skills. So roll up your sleeves, take out your scope and sequence, try writing some short decodable texts for, for um, your beginning readers. And this is another activity that's fun to do with a partner. We offer some guidance in the book about how to do it. And you don't have to be writing whole books here. A simple photo like this that inspires a few sentences that are well aligned to the sorts of decoding work you want your kids to have can be a great starting point. Um, again, we offer those tools on our site that can help you offering some, some word, um, word lists. I hear my dog coming into the room. Um, so we end this chapter with this quote, maximizing orthographic learning opportunities from the start requires texts that will give children reasons to slow down and look closely at print, even if this makes them sound less skilled for a little while. So there you have it, a 222 overview of Shifting the Balance, all six chapters. And 
So we would like to hear um, what high leverage starting point resonated with you and why. Take just a second and share with us now um, in the chat box, which mm -hmm. of these chapters or starting points really spoke to you? And as you do that, and as we wrap up part two of this webinar series, um, where we've explored these high leverage starting points for bringing more science of reading into the balanced literacy classroom. Um, we again want to remind you one more time, this book is only meant to be a starting point. It's not an exhaustive exploration of the reading science that's out there. It's not meant to be the last book anyone would read on the topic. But for many, we hope it might be a safe and simple entry point one that cracks the door open, sparks more curiosity and leads to both action and more exploration. Carrie, someone, um, Angela, uh, said she loved the way we did the 222 approach. That was only because we'd already done the whole thing and thought, John is gonna kill us if we get on there and we have 4,000 slides. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Looks like high frequency words resonated with lots of folks. Yeah, it really did. And and go ahead. Sorry, Carrie. Yeah, we see high frequency shifting high frequency word instruction as one of the most exciting and appealing entry points to the science. I mean, orthographic mapping is the is the hook once you're in there, and it just leads to all of this sort of domino effect of science. But it's so powerful right away because it's it's such a real thing that teachers are struggling with every day yeah high frequency words are already a pain point in, yeah. in balanced literacy classrooms and so did you stop sharing the slides carrie do i see this oh nope there they are sorry um so did you talk about next week carrie I'm we're sorry, on, i was reading we're, we're going to talk about next week right now jan you are in okay. fact Oh, I am. Yeah, we're looking at a slide that has part three on it. Okay. Oh, there it is. We appreciate your time and we appreciate you, Donna. Yay, Donna. Um, <laughs> oh, I love you guys. You're my new favorite people. <laughs> and we hope you'll join us next week at the same time. Um, we'll come together one last time and answer some questions about the book and support you in thinking how to get change started right in your own backyard. Please send any questions you have to Jan and Carrie at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Yep, and we'll pull your questions into next week's content. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble advancing now. <laughs> so, or you can send us a message through the six shifts.com yeah. where you can download the PDFs of the tools we mentioned tonight as well as some others. And the tools are all a work in progress. So if you see a way we can make them better, please reach out. We've made a number of changes based on feedback. So thank you again for being here tonight and we appreciate your time, your kind energy and your commitment to bridge building. Yeah, and your patience with our um, fumbliness with technology <laughs> and Carrie ending up to drive it, which probably, um, we got off to a slow start, but we, we got through it. It was better well, than me driving, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Donna. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, we do appreciate you so much. <laughs> All right. Oh, good night. I'm gonna and stop. You'll send us the chat, Donna. You'll send us the chat again. Yep. I know we did that for ourselves last week, Jan. We did. We did. We did. Yeah, everyone, you can download your own chat if you want. Remind me how to do it, Donna. You walked me through it last yep. week. Go to the chat and on the bottom are three dots on the right hand side. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Tony. Maeve, what a beautiful name. <laughs> we all need a little therapy these days, don't we, Angela? <laughs> For sure. Um, Do you see it, Carrie? Um, I, I didn't probably hear what you said. I might have been not quite with you. I so. got it. I can see it. You got it, I got it. Or I think All I right. got it. I did the process. So, yeah, All right, open friends. Up the chat and on the bottom, 
There's three dots on the right hand side. Yeah. Save chat. It's the first save thing that I opened it yeah. four times and didn't see. Yeah, you should so it'll, decode it'll, first, Carrie. It'll save to your computer. Yeah. 